Welcome, everyone, to this webinar on ancestral karma and healings for ancestral karma. And of course, as usual, I'd like to do the warm up, the usual warm up that we're all used to, which is a um, brief review what is energy healing, then three minutes of silence, and then a uh, prayer of gratitude, and then diving into today's topic. Tons of amazing questions came in like, wow, so, you know, sometimes when I run webinars, like I've run webinars where not a single question came in. And then others where lots and lots of questions came in. So we're in one of those webinars where lots of questions are coming in, which is always a delight to me because I would rather speak to your concerns and your questions rather than, um, you know, attempting to just guess <laughs> <laughs> what you guys want to hear. But, you know, of course, always a lot of it is also all the new information that's come in for me in the last few weeks since or months since the last webinar. So anyway, it's good to be here with all of you. Let's uh, talk about what is energy healing for the new people. Energy healing is a technology, essentially, of consciousness. And it's based on the premise of focusing attention or awareness, which is essentially pure source material. Okay. So we have like the source of creation, and then we've got the whole manifest field, the way the source shows up in order to affect its own evolution. Essentially, that's it. There's one source of creation and it wants to evolve. And it does so by manifesting this material realm of creation and then interacting with the manifested field or realm of creation in a way that promotes its own evolution. That's a story. It's the one story that's happening. And all of our little individual evolutionary stories that are, you know, part and parcel of that one big story. Um, so awareness or attention is source material. Like we have the autonomy and freedom to focus source material around to like guide it around the universe, wherever we want to guide it around. And it's so fluid. It's so flexible. It is not constrained by space or time or anything. You know, your imagination is the limit kind of, I can just literally go anywhere you can think to go. You can put your awareness there. Ends of the universe and back again, right? So awareness is a powerful thing because wherever it goes, it enlivens or awakens the value of source there where it goes. And the principle is that illness or infirmities or imbalances are the, I want to say they are the dynamic interface between the source of creation uh, manifesting into a form that it has created where the form becomes, we could say the form requires some transformation. I was going to say the form becomes insufficient, but it's that the form is overwhelmed by the diversity of the field within, its ex within which it resides. Maybe I better say that again, because this is really an interesting and key point imbalances or infirmities, sickness, illness, problems, issues, even lessons, challenges that we face. All these problemy things are the byproduct of the fact that the form that's trying to sort of harbor growth at that moment is overwhelmed by the field in which it is residing. So the form is not integrating its own place and position within the field. It's therefore the overwhelm causes the form and causes the consciousness that's, that's um, using that form as an anchor to the relative, you could say. It causes the consciousness to forget its connection to wholeness. It forgets that it is made of the one, right? Because the whole thing is just the one. There's one source of creation is doing this thing. But as it does it, it's like, it's doing it kind of like daringly, like it's taking a few risks, you could say. The one is taking a few risks. And it'll create a form that's so like out there. It's so enmeshed in, in the field of form itself that the form 
and all that's part and parcel with that form, all the consciousness within it and feelings and everything, forget that they're part of the one. So there's a piece. And so we could say, to put that really simply, separation is the foundation of all problems. There, in a sentence, separation is a problem, is the foundation of all problems. But the mechanics, the, the reason I said it complicatedly is because it's important to understand exactly what does that mean when we say separation? What do we mean when we say separation? Because in order to heal the problem, we have to actually understand what precisely is going on there. And precisely the evolutionary process of the one as experienced by us as humans. So we're experiencing that evolutionary process as a coordination between expansion of consciousness and refinement of the nervous system. More expansion of consciousness, more refinement of the nervous system. More expansion of consciousness, more refinement of the nervous system. And this process of expanding consciousness and refining the nervous system, and expanding consciousness and refining the nervous system more like that, what it does is it gives rise to a form, a physical form that is so flexible and so stable that no matter how big the consciousness expands, no matter how much the source of creation moves into the field and, and if expresses itself as diversity and, and interesting interest and, and differences, the one is never lost. The, the connection to the one is never lost because the form is integrated. So it's lack of integration in the form which is responsible for feeling overwhelmed by the expanded experience. And that feeling overwhelmed causes the anchor back to the wholeness to be lost. And as soon as the anchor back to the wholeness is lost, then we have to go through a process of regaining it. And that's what we would call the healing process. That is the healing process is reestablishing connection with wholeness. And as Connection with wholeness is reestablished. The form evolves. The body, the nervous system, the physical structure that houses the consciousness changes, becomes more refined, more perfect, an expression of the one, more filled with light, more balanced, more balanced. So, energy healing is the mechanics by which we seek out those areas that have gotten overwhelmed by the field and by the universe. It's a big universe, right? It's easy, like, like we're just like little tinier than grains of sand and it's easy to be overwhelmed by the universe. And energy healing is the process of seeking out, figuring out like which area we need to look at, which is the most overwhelmed at any given moment. And then focusing in, focusing awareness, which is source material in on that part. And by focusing awareness in activating or enlivening wholeness within that part, because the wholeness is always there. Like the wholeness is actually never lost. Even when the part feels overwhelmed, wholeness is still there. So, but, but the focusing of attention reminds the part that the wholeness is still there. And so when, then when the part has been reminded that the wholeness is still there, the part goes, oh, you know what? I'm uncomfortable because I need to change like this. And it, and the, the presence of the awareness creates this trust and softness, and it kind of creates all the conditions required to help the part which has lost its way and it feels separate find its way back and the fun of energy healing is kind of being engaged with that process and watching that process witnessing it and also promoting it and um and enjoying how that process gives what we would call meaning to our human lives it gives meaning to life it's a very special thing. So, well, that was a long explanation of what is energy, probably the longest one I ever gave, but I'm glad I got to, you know, do that. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me. And I'm just opening up the question and answer box here.
yeah, so many great questions came in. And so I would like to um, be sure to start in on questions a little early tonight. And I think that will probably work out well because, you know, we all know what ancestors are. Oh, and I might have to stop to kill a mosquito because there's like one mosquito in this room. And I am not at all opposed to killing mosquitoes. So. <laughs> right? I see you. <laughs> okay. So let's see. Where do we go from here? Oh, yes. So now the three minutes of silence. I'll ask everyone to close the eyes. I'll be muting myself. And then after three minutes, I'll ask you to open the eyes. Be sure to take plenty of time to come out of the silence. We start with the source of creation. This is, this is how we start energy healing is bringing awareness into the source of creation. And that closing the eyes settles down the awareness and allows the mind to experience to whatever degree one is able, the source of creation. So let's close our eyes. Let's take a moment and then come out of the silence slowly.
thank you to the source of creation for being everything, for being everyone in this healing session and the ancestors of everyone in this healing session. Thank you for being that precious golden connection between the absolute and the relative. Thank you for our webinar hour and 15 minutes that we may use it in the most valuable, meaningful, efficient, and powerful way. May we be discriminating and pluck out those points which are most useful for everyone here. Thank you to all of you for being with me because it is my great joy to be in this position as the voice of our collective, as the servant. I appreciate the opportunity to serve. I appreciate the opportunity to engage in acts of devotion. This is so precious and I am so grateful. Thank you. Okay, so I'm ready. Um, we've talked to a certain degree about ancestors, obviously here and there in the past, unless organized way. Um, but today the whole focus is on uh, clearing ancestral karma and what does that mean and how do we focus our attention to make that happen uh, really effectively, uh, particularly for those of you who may be suffering from some, from any type of congenital illness or who are carrying patterning and conditioning from uh, the ancestral lineage, it's very important to have some sense of how this works. Um, so I thought I'd start with just a, a little kind of a review or overview of some of the basic principles associated with ancestral work. And then we go into the work and of course, hoping to really, you know, dig into some of these wonderful questions. All right. The seat of ancestral presence in the body is the DNA, obviously, and that includes the epigenome, which is around the DNA. Now, obviously, the epigenome is very responsive to your experience. So we start out with, a DNA, with an epigenome, which is, has been cultivated or forged over the course of centuries and received from the parents essentially parents, grandparents, has been received from the ancestors in the way that they uh, affected it, right? The way that they formed their epigenome. We get our epigenome from them. But then the experiences that we have in this lifetime will influence that epigenome. And a lot of times the experiences that we have that, that affect or you know, cause the epigenome to show up in a certain way are a byproduct of our interactions with our parents, grandparents, and other family members. So there's still a pretty strong ancestral connection when it comes to the shape and form of the epigenome. Okay. This is important for those of you who aren't fully aware of the connection. The situation is that the DNA which does have the ability itself also to change. Like we, it's well recorded that the DNA, for example, repairs itself. And when the DNA repairs itself, it, it untwists. And then these little uh, repair enzymes, healing enzymes crawl along the, the DNA strand and they find the piece of the DNA that has been corrupted for whatever reason and can actually repair the sequence of the DNA. But much more commonly, um, the way the DNA shows up is a byproduct of the epigenome, which is the electromagnetic spectrum created by ionized proteins, which is around the DNA. Okay, so the electromagnetic spectrum created by ionized proteins is tremendously flexibly, pliably responsive to feelings. 
responsive to feelings. Because of that, um, in energy healing, we have an angle to approach the epigenome with awareness to really, in a really powerful and really effective way, support the healthiest possible arrangement of those ionized proteins so that they talk to the DNA. Basically, they're talking to the DNA. And even though it's the same DNA in every cell in the whole body, obviously, some of the cells show up as liver cells, and others show up as hair cells, and others show up as skin cells, and, 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 and. And so we know that the same DNA has a really vast potential to show up in all sorts of different ways. And this has to do with the influence of the epigenome telling which parts of the DNA to turn on and which parts to turn off in order for the cell to show up like the, as the correct body part, essentially to align with the correct body part so that we have eye cells in our eyes <laughs> and not some other kind of cells. Okay. Um, I'm just putting my awareness on the epigenome, just starting to take a read into the field of the ancestors for all of us. I think, I think, I mean, that's really all there is. I just, the overview of the DNA, the epigenome and how it's inherited from the ancestors and how we interact. That's a good start. Oh, there is one other side of that, which is energetically, if we put attention on the epigenome and the DNA, what we find is an area in our field of consciousness, which I have identified with the word ancestral archive. It really is nothing other than the energetic form or frequency of our DNA and our epigenome. But the word or the term ancestral archive helps to define the subtle structure of the DNA and the epigenome. Just a little download for everyone there to identify that part of the inner landscape, which is the ancestral archive. Where do we, how do we find, how do we define, how are we sure that we found the ancestral archive in order to do the energy healing that is required at any given time? Hang on, just one more small adjustment. That's better. Okay. Um, tradition. Tradition. There's certain things that all the ancestors have in common. And one of them is the union of a mother and a father. And that union, that tradition, goes back all the way back, all the way back even before Homo sapiens appeared. It's an old tradition. So the tradition itself is one of the characteristic features of the ancestral archive. And here, we need to look at, because we're, oh, in such an interesting time. This is now that we're looking at this tradition. We're at such an interesting time in human history where a lot of the structures that we have uh, taken for granted for hundreds of years are kind of under question. They're being questioned right now. And like, is it even necessary to have traditions like that? Right. You know, we have, I have family members who decided to not get married, but just have a best friend ceremony just to promise to be each other's best friends, which is fine. I mean, you know, people need to do it their way, of course, obviously, but, um, and maybe that's more the way it was done back in the early days, you know, before the whole marriage ceremony thing came into being and not all parents were married. Right. Obviously. So there are variations.
that this principle of the male and female uniting, that's, we don't get away from that. That's sort of it's an essential component. And so we could say that the union of male and female while remaining uniquely different from one another is the tradition upon which physiology after physiology has emerged into this world. And that principle of the two parts which are different from one another, experiencing their union, and yet at the same time, the union supports the differences, right? The union allows the feminine to feel very feminine, allows the masculine to feel very masculine. So it's not that the union makes the feminine more masculine, the masculine more feminine. No, the union makes the feminine more feminine. It, it, it supports the process of diversification, essentially. And it's beautiful because that process is a great metaphor for the way the healing process happens when you have a form that's lost its connection to wholeness, and then it reunites and it, it finds its way back to realizing that it is wholeness expressing itself as a diversified form. The same mechanic occurs that the diversified form is then liberated in a sense to be even more diversified, even more itself, even more of a sort of a densely manifest version of wholeness or totality, of the unmanifest wholeness and totality. It's a very interesting dynamic that by placing awareness at a point of balance between unmanifest eternal wholeness and the whole diverse field of creation with all of its differences, that there's a point in there that's so delightfully perfect that it allows all the differences to realize themselves as expressions of the one. And the support from the source of creation allows those separate forms to become even more themselves, even more interesting, even more specific. just like the union between male and female. It's like they uphold each other's uniqueness and they uphold the values in each other that are the quintessential expressions of wholeness for those forms. The female form becomes even more female, right? Because it gets pregnant. And then it's like they're making the baby and like, how female is that? Like, there's nothing more female than that. That's like the essence of female right there. And so it's really beautiful. So again, there seems to be a kind of a download coming in. Like kind of, I, I say again, I mean, returning to the fact that energetically we're doing kind of healing. There's a healing going on. It's this lovely download that in a very simple and very beautiful way just supports everybody's ability to recognize this fundamental truth about the nature of tradition, the tradition of a mother and a father. And as this download is coming in and as the recognition of this fundamental truth is becoming more and more stabilized for each one of us. I mean, for some of you, you're sitting there probably saying, well, yeah, duh. <laughs> like she didn't, I didn't need to, to pay that much money to have her tell me this. I knew this. Right. But the thing is that when we're working at a subtle level of energy, this information is not just, it's not just what it means at the surface, but it goes sort of deep down viscerally inside the being. It's not just about men and women specifically. It's also about this energy healing process by which the piece that's gotten separated or thinks that it's separate from the source of creation finds its way back to being integrated, knowing itself to be 
an expressed form of wholeness. Okay, so it is wholeness, but it has shape and has meaning and it has value and it has some specific form there. Um, that mechanic is sort of awakened and alivened at a very kind of deep visceral level of the physiology. And each one of us has a physiology that was born as either a male physiology or a female physiology. And so this, this aspect of the healing goes deep, deep down into the DNA, which is where all that information is contained, obviously, and um, supports the specific qualities unique to each physiology, supports those qualities. And with that, there is this tremendous rise of mercy and compassion and self-recognition and I would say grace. And it brings me around to a point that was like surfacing earlier, but I didn't give voice to it. I'd like to give voice to it now. And that is for some time now, I've talked about how there's a kind of darkness that sits with humanity in the hearts of mankind, which is a kind of a deep malevolent energy. And of course, any deep malevolent energy is what I described earlier. It's some piece of creation where the form that houses that is incapable of dealing with the level of diversity of the field in which it exists. And therefore it loses, it becomes overwhelmed. It loses contact with wholeness. So there's a piece in all of us that is like that, that where the form of our physiologies, the way we're made, that there's this piece of the form that has trouble recognizing itself completely within the field of the material world without losing connection to the source of creation. And that's responsible for the malevolence and the darkness and things like, like we know, just look at the news. There's plenty out there. There's all kinds of troubles going on. Um, however, poisons and antidotes sit side by side. And it turns out that there's also incredible softness and compassion in sort of woven into the fabric of the human condition and the human heart. One of the things I do, I've done for a long time, but I've started doing it in a more um, sort of orderly fashion, we could say, is I provide a service to individuals who have taken their own lives, or have done something that is a miniature version of taking their own lives. Sometimes people don't take their whole own life, but they, they pull the life out of themselves in certain ways, you know? And what I noticed was so fascinating. I noticed this pattern, like working with thousands and thousands of people, thousands, tens of thousands of people, uh, even hundreds of thousands of people, that there is a quality of sweetness and compassion in the heart that's always there. It's always there, even at the point where a person offs themselves. Even then, there is a love very, very, very often. I know this directly through my own even family lineage, because I, there's suicide in my family lineage, that the last words that my grandfather spoke or were, he had he was doing himself in, and his last words to his family were, I hope now you can be happy. And he really had convinced himself that he was doing the right thing for his family because he loved them. He loved them and he wanted them to be happy. And he thought that, you know, he was kind of a burden on them because he wasn't a happy camper. And because of his his unhappiness as a person, he felt like it would be easier for them if he wasn't there, you know? And it's, it's interesting that like, when you look at that, you realize all oh, the fundamental there, the fundamental essence that was going on in the heart, even at the time that the actions were, we could say, misguided at best, 
um, you know, the actual fundamental was this incredible love. And it reminded me of a quote from Marishi that love in the heart of man is the shrine of God on earth. Love in the heart of mankind, we could say, is the shrine of God on earth. There's no part of us that's actually separated out from the source of creation. And the anchor point is a quality of love that resides in the hearts of all mankind. It's actually a very sweet thing. And even at the point of like maximum negativity, I mean, can we say there's anything worse? Murder is like terrible, but then if you murder yourself, like, ugh, you know, it's like the worst of the worst. It's really awful. It's just, I mean, and I, I like, I can't, you know, I'm at a loss of words, honestly, to uh, describe like how bad that is. But the point is that even that, even at that point, this beautiful love is present in the heart. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And that love is the anchor to the source of creation. And that love is the channel, really, through which awareness is birthed into the field of consciousness. So the awareness that we focus around when we're focusing on this, that, and the other is carried on a foundation of this beautiful, beautiful love. So even when the awareness goes over and it looks at the malevolent bits, right? The dark bits, even then it carries with it this incredible quality, which provides a context for the darkest, most malevolent energies to gracefully with dignity, find their way back to their connection to the source of creation, find their way back to the recognition that even in this amazing, diverse, incredible, <laughs> indescribably complex world, even here, the one unmanifest wholeness can be found. I see you. <laughs> He's being real sneaky. Okay. Anyway. So. This principle of focusing awareness on the DNA and focusing the awareness on the epigenome and from that physical form, finding the way into the ancestral archive and honoring and appreciating the value of tradition that is inherent in everyone's ancestral archive. First, like that's... That's the context, folks. That's the, that's the point of connection there. And as we put attention on that aspect of our own nature and of our dear ancestors, it, it provides an angle into the ancestral archive that really genuinely honors our ancestors. <laughs> Don't mind if one of these times, you know, because, uh, yeah, it's just the way it is. Anyway. <laughs> My husband usually helps me when I have like a technical issue and I can kind of feel him in the other room thinking, oh, you know what? I can't exactly come in and swat that mosquito for her. <laughs> it's okay. I love you, sweetheart. It's okay. We'll just, when the time is right, you know. I'll just do it. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, with all due respect to Anne Breckenbach, who said, oh, no, no, you should never kill mosquitoes, right? Because they're like, they deserve to eat, and they deserve to live. And I'm like, yeah, and they've come to me for an honorable death. So that's just the way that's going to be. <laughs> so anyway, um, all right. <sighs> It's never any coincidence. It's never any coincidence. I'm looking at the ancestral archive of everybody in our group, and we have such a spectrum of personalities and life stories and souls and honorable deaths and dishonorable deaths and so and so. So much, so much, such an amazing 
proliferation of human stories, stories of human existence. And within there, the, the points that I'm seeing that are asking for attention are the points where ancestors performed actions that they really felt remorseful about after they finished their lifetimes. The worst actions often are very difficult for people to actually fess up to or face up to during the lifetime itself. And frequently, out of compassion, what happens is the soul, the inner landscape of the soul arranges itself so that the individual just basically doesn't have to deal with the karma of the really bad actions until after the death, and then in a state of grace in the spirit world, where there really isn't any judgment, harsh judgments or anything at that point, then the soul can look in a very neutral way, in a uh, indifferent way to, to their actions, and can focus their attention on those really weak areas of the personality in a way that allows them to affect some transformation of the issues that in them, in their personalities that gave rise to actions that were really damaging to others. Because you can justify anything, right? Just like the grandfather. Yes, that would have been my grandfather, right? He justified doing something he shouldn't have done. He justified it with like, but I love my family, so I'm going to off myself. You can justify anything. So people justify things. However, if we look at these things, if we look at all these patterns across the spectrum of the ancestral archive, what we see is um, times of deficiency and times of excess. And that the values of when a person possesses values of deficiency or values of excess across any of a variety of different spectrums of personality uh, characteristics. And this is like, this is you guys directly from Aristotle, right? Aristotle was the, the man who espoused virtues, human virtues. And he said that all of the human virtues are essentially a balance point between deficiency and excess of different qualities. Uh, for example, the deficiency that would make a person a coward or the excess that would make them foolhardy can be balanced to promote a virtue of bravery or courage. And it doesn't mean that you get rid of cowardice or you get rid of foolhardiness. It means that you bring them together in an artful way that allows these vices to act as a virtue. And this is precisely the patterning that occurs when we shift the physiology around so that we can accommodate the incredible diversity of our world. I'm saying this to you, but I'm saying it to the ancestors too. Or the, the, it's like a download that's coming all the way into the DNA and the epigenome. It balance. This is the balance. We're talking about the balance between deficiency and excess. And how do we promote the precise balance, and not just in the field of, of courage, but along the entire spectrum of all the qualities that make up human experience and personality and make up our nature, right? How do we balance the epigenome? And oh, I've got the most luscious direction to take this. Tomorrow, I've got uh, one of our Europeans sent in some recent research um, in the field of uh, epigenetics, and it was just absolutely priceless. Uh, the article was just so wonderful, which of course, Tom, can you make a note uh, that we should put that article as a link into the uh, recordings that we send everybody? But it's just a very short article, but it's just really, really interesting. And essentially it talks about the balance in the epigenome. It, it talks about um, new ways that scientists are using to measure lifespan and how this advanced understanding of lifespan gives us insight into how 
ex how to extend life, right? And the principle here is there's a dual value, of course, not one that Aristotle had thought of. God bless, God rest his soul and thank him for all of his contributions to uh, modern thought. But um, between uh, values like, like growth and then stopping growth, or one of the things that um, the human brain does between ages like seven and 25 is it prunes out all the neural connections that are unnecessary and unuseful and um, uh, not valuable for the uh, development of the full potential of the individual. And that pruning process, if it goes beyond its natural limit, eventually becomes a process that gives rise to uh, dementia, right? Because if you prune and 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 prune, all of your neural connections after a while, <laughs> there's not so many neural connections left, right? So the principle here is, you know, how do you decide where's the balance? Where is the balance between the necessary pruning required at a very early age in order to develop and grow as a you know, a human who can live a meaningful, useful, successful, happy, you know, progressive life, a thrive in their life um, versus the pruning that takes out aspects of the mental functioning, which we need, we need to be able to think and things like that. So yeah, where is that balance? And that balance, they find that the balance has to sit in the epigenome. And the balance is, from my perspective, as an energy healer, I look at it energetically, right? So I look at the value of balance. And, and when I look at the value of balance, what I see is it's like a golden, it's like, it's like um, an aesthetically pleasing relationship, right? I was going to say the golden ratio, right? But it's, it's like, there's a, there's a, the balance has a sort of perfection in it, has a sort of imperfect perfection in it. The balance isn't necessarily a perfect bifurcation. You notice you have like two perfectly identical halves on either side, but the balance, the balance has a, first of all, it has to reside within the spectrum, right? Because situations and circumstances vary, times of life vary, right? You wanna probably really do more vigorous pruning, but between the ages of seven and 25, and then far less vigorous pruning later on, obviously, or maybe none. Um, but also the balance, when I look at the point of balance, there's something beautiful about it. There's something about the, how one balances say between, for example, cowardice and foolhardiness. If you balance exactly in the middle, you might get a little bit too much foolhardiness, right? You might want to balance like slightly over on the conservative side, or we could say the, the side of like not sacrificing yourself, right? Like courage is good. Bravery is good. But the balance has to be like enough. It has to be sort of oriented toward the conservatism side, the, the being careful side, so that um, when you're making moment by moment choices in a, in a dicey situation, that the choices favor your survival and therefore your perpetuation, the, sus the sustaining of your life. Because if the balance is straight smack in the middle, it could be quite like, like it means that the outcome could end up being not a very nice outcome for you, right? It could be an outcome that doesn't honor the eternal nature of your being. In fact, on every side, and this is something very much one of the issues that the ancestors have faced and that they have passed on to us over the centuries, which is if we look back, you know, back into the time of Aristotle and I've made mistakes with dates in the past. So I'm not going to try to go there again, Tom, maybe you can look up the dates of Aristotle so we can just put them out there in a very kind of, you know, 
precise manner. But aspects of that chart of deficiencies of vices, deficiencies in excess, aspects of the deficiencies have been redefined as honorable, as virtues, in fact, over the centuries. So what our ancestors have done is in many cases, they have adopted um, functions that disallow the development of their full potential, that disallow them to evolve very nicely in their lifetime in favor of being what would be considered humble, for example, like under the uh, umbrella term humility, in a lot of cases was self-sacrifice and even martyrdom, even to the point of martyrdom. And even now in modern culture, there is a move to normalize excess, right? Like in our modern culture at this time, there is a certain, the balance is a little bit over on the excess side. And so you see people, you know, kind of moving into degeneracy and kind of supporting each other in that degenerate behavior and saying, yeah, this is, this is where the balance is. Like, yeah, let's move the balance over here into degeneracy. And like, we all agree that that's the right place for the balance. So we can all just do as we please. But the thing is that this balance isn't something that is contrived or even human created. The, the actual balance is like, it's natural. It's completely natural. It's, it's, it's overseen by laws of nature which emerge from or are derived directly from the flow of source into the material field of creation. The point of balance isn't something that we arbitrarily decide. It is, it is a, a natural phenomenon and an outcropping of nature's intelligence. So really what that means is the responsibility is on us to decide where the adjustment needs to make. So what are we doing? We're kind of like overcompensating to a certain degree in modern society for the mistakes of our own ancestors of having been too far in the direction of deficiency on several accounts. Self-deprecation. You know, you can't go to jail for self-deprecation. It's not considered a crime. But um, the opposite of self-deprecation, which is narcissism, is it's, you also don't go to jail for narcissism usually, uh, unless it manifests as behaviors that are really antisocial. Um, but it's considered, you know, a sociopathic disease, basically. It's considered a disease. But if a person's just, oh, well, you know, that was nothing. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not important. You know, like that's not really considered a sociopathic disease. <laughs> the balance between them is truth. The balance between those two opposites is truth. This, I say this truth. And when I say this truth, I'm saying to the ancestors and the value of truth is unifying with the value of balance. And it's going in there to the epigenome and it's saying, this is my truth. This is who I really am with my imperfections and my perfections. I am the source of creation, experiencing itself as a human, in a human condition, experiencing itself as a human life in a human body so that it can know itself. So that the human will be inspired as a human, I will be inspired to understand my creation better, the field, the whole creation. I'm inspired to understand the creation better. It's that desire to understand the creation, which has fueled innumerable, innumerable meaningful lives in the history of the soul, in the history of the physiology. Meaningfulness in life which gives life its sparkle, it gives it its spirit, is fueled by engaging 
in the process of knowing the field and knowing oneself as an aspect of that field and how we as individuals fit into the field. And each ancestor, we have like the, the field of our ancestry, right? And for those of you who are producing offspring or have produced offspring and they're producing offspring and so forth, we're, you know, you're with it, you're in the middle of a, a lineage, right? And for those who aren't, doesn't matter. You're still like, like the expression of this lineage. And you have, there are other branches, obviously, around. All of us have branches around us of, you know, cousins and aunts and uncles and in-laws of all types and varieties. <sighs> Nephews and nieces. So we understand ourselves and who and what we actually are within the context of this sequence of souls. This is the reason for going into the ancestral archive, is to wake up and enliven the point of the ancestral archive within the ancestral archive that is oneself. Because in our living human bodies, we are the hope of enlightenment for the whole spectrum, for the whole sequence, we're the hope. We're in our human bodies. So we're, we're the ones who are actually sitting with the DNA, with the epigenome, influencing and affecting the epigenome. And as we influence and affect our epigenome in our human bodies right now, we have a divine influence upon the form of the ancestors. We are the form of our ancestors, right? And wherever the souls are, and many of them not in their bodies, right? Most of them, very few of them. What we have sometimes, depending on how old you are, my granddaughter is one year old. So she's got parents, grandparents, and great grandma. She's got a great grandma. So that's, she's got four, you know, one, two, three generations above her. But that's about, that's the max, man. That is the maxed out. I mean, all right, in some parts of the world, it's very possible that people can have you know, four or five, even six, maybe. I think I saw a video recently from a family in China, and first the little boy comes, then his father, then his father, then his father, then his father, then his father. Like, that's like, this is like a line of six of them or seven or something. I can't even remember how many. It was quite wonderful. Tom, make a note to send. It's a very short thing, but it's absolutely lovely. <laughs> Just for everyone's pleasure and delight. Just for your pleasure and delight. Thank you. Thank you, my husband, for helping me. All right. Um, where we are in the sequence is the point of power and autonomy over the ancestral archive. That's why it's so absolutely cool and amazing to be a human being, because we're in a position where our awareness doesn't just influence or affect our physiologies and our lives and ourselves, but it affects the entire spectrum going forward and backward. And as I said, even if you don't have offspring, if you're affecting the spectrum going backward, that means you're also affecting the spectrum going forward through other, other branches of the family, right? So you're helping people, you're helping, helping. You're helping your loved ones. You're helping your family. Just watching those changes. I'm just watching everyone like a beacon. Each of us like a beacon. We, when we put, so what are we doing energy healing? We're focusing our awareness into the ancestral archive. When we focus our awareness into the ancestral archive, our awareness of our position within the context of the sequence of souls causes us as individuals to be like magnets, that we were both beacons, so we give out the light of understanding, right, to the ancestors, it helps to put their their, um, it helps them to define the point of balance that they need in order to move forward in their evolutionary process in the most evolutionary way. But we're also like magnets because 
as soon as going into the ancestral archive, we're like a beacon. We bring our awareness in and our awareness is like a light, right? So it goes into the ancestral archive and lights it up. But <clears throat> identifying ourselves as a point within the sequence makes us like a magnet because then we're also attracting the specific information required where we're placing ourselves in such a way that we are maximally receptive to the information that we need to make the most effective in-depth decisions about how to cultivate the flow of awareness so that it benefits the ancestral archive maximally. I, li I like this part where it's happening. It's happening for everyone there. And of course, that's a great piece of information, right? Like the ancestors, they can have that information too. Why not share with them everything, right? We share with them everything that you have. So they also, they also, it wakes up their ability to see themselves within the context of the sequence of souls. And, and the beautiful thing is that <clears throat> for those of us who are parents or grandparents, we don't have very many, just like when you're looking back up, there are not that many living souls in the lineage actually still alive in their bodies. Well, when you're looking down the line, there are not that many living souls in the lineage either, right? But when you get yourself really like tightly balanced, balanced into the sequence of the souls in the ancestral archive like that, then the archive kind of opens up and you can see back beyond the, your living relatives and beyond the relatives that you have uh, family history stories of. And you can also sense the presence of the souls going forward in the lineage as well. And for those of you who are not parents, you can sense the, the other branches as they move forward in the lineage. And see how the unifying characteristic throughout the entire lineage is that love. It's that love, that eternal love that's in the heart. That is the shrine of God on earth, right? It is the anchor point to the source of creation. That provides the blueprint or the context in which the lineage evolves into the future. So that the manifestation of human souls going into the future become more and more and more the bodies, the bodies become more and more attuned to or we could say stable and adaptable and more and more able to give expression to the divine and are more and more able to navigate through a world that becomes more and more diverse. Like we've already really seen this in a big way in our lifetimes right now. Just the fact that we all are meeting on Zoom right now and how the amount of information, uh, some people are calling this now the information age. Because of the internet, there's just so much information available. My son said to me years ago, I think he even said, that because of the internet, the amount of information that any one of us has at our fingertips right now as just citizens, uh, he was referring to here in the United States, the citizens of the United States is more than was available to the presidents of the United States in the past. You know, presidents were privy to, you know, select information and, you know, stuff that other people didn't know about. I mean, they still are, obviously, but the point is that the common man wasn't, didn't have at his fingertips so much information, and now we do. So this is an experience or an expression of the diversification and the increasing, um, the, the fields becoming increasingly complex. We have to keep up with that. 
And our ancestors absolutely will have to keep up with that. If the physiologies cannot keep up with that, then the access to the information might, there'll come a point, they'll become like a tipping point where something happens and we slide backwards technologically. And that, that type of thing has happened in the past. So we have to think for a minute that we're coming up to the same threshold that we came up to before as a race, where the technology was expanding so quickly that the physiologies had to adapt to the increased flow of information and all sorts of other aspects of technological advancement. And the physiologies in the past somehow weren't able to adapt quickly enough. And as a result, the technology was lost. So now what we're doing is we're using energy healing to up the ante, so to say, or to increase our chances as a race of people to be able to adapt in a way that serves the intentions of the creator for our role in our relationship with the expanding diversity of the field around us. It helps to know what you're doing. It helps to know that this is what we're doing. Because once, you, once we know it, then there are all kinds of mechanisms already set up within the system to just start to engage in that particular direction. And from my perspective, one of the great keys is balance, is this balancing act that occurs where the, I think Aristotle was really flame on. I mean, you know, why his work has survived to this day. I'm, just, I'm sure it's many centuries. Oh, yes, anyway. Deficiency and excess in all these different areas, right? All these different areas, everything from the virtues that he talked about to um, just how much pruning goes on inside the brain. You don't want a deficiency of pruning, but you don't want excess of pruning either. You want to combine the, the deficiency side, which is knowing exactly when to stop with the excess side of getting rid of everything you don't need. And you want to combine them in this artful manner so that the all the branches of the neural network in the body are the ones that you need precisely without the ones you don't need. And this happens in the DNA and the epigenome too. Oh, you guys, so many questions coming in. I'm looking at the time. Let's see. Uh, we start at 530. Okay, so we've got about a half an hour. I think I should go into questions because there's a whole pile here and I can see there's a bunch coming in up over here as well. And I, I love to be able to get to everybody's question, right? Like that's nice. And I've spoken quite a bit about all of this. And I know that what I didn't speak about today was the karma side of it, right? We're talking about ancestral karma, but karma obviously is returns on past actions. And sometimes the word karma can just mean action. But I, I'm hoping that maybe tomorrow we'll go even more deeply, or maybe within the context of the questions, we'll go more deeply into the actual aspect of karma and you know what do we do about karma? Okay. This person says that they are aware, I'm, I'm rephrasing your question a little bit, just reframing it a little bit. They are aware that many people are experiencing at this time intense purification. Yeah, how many people experiencing intense purification? Anybody else out there? I would say over this end, oh, <clears throat> dear anonymous attendee who asked this question, Many people are raising their hands. You are correct. Many people are experiencing intense purification at this time. And one of the reasons is the thing I just mentioned, that the diversification of our world is increasing at an accelerating rate. And we cannot lean on the, 
the survival skills and the technologies of our ancestors to deal with this situation because they weren't dealing with this situation. Okay, can be due in part to a fear that we may not succeed in fulfilling our soul's purpose. So that part of the statement, your question, can be taken both from an individual level and from a collective level, right? Because we could say, well, part of the soul's purpose as a collective is for us to quickly figure out how we are going to adapt to this incredible expansion of information and complexity in the field. Uh, but also from an individual level, I suppose we could say there's also the fear or concern that perhaps as an individual, we've come into this lifetime and we're not going to fulfill that intention of the soul that brought us into the lifetime. I would like to, even though there's more to this question, um, because she's tying it in, or they are tying it into the ancestors, and therefore be disappointed to our, be a disappointment to our ancestors. Oh, like that they would look to the future and go, oh, that's a generation that blew it, <laughs> something like that. I mean, already our children, I can say for those of us who are like middle age here, my adult children have mentioned on many an occasion, hey, you're the ones who screwed up your generation created this situation that now we have to fix like climate change and all that. So, so it goes from, it comes from both sides, <laughs> I guess is what I'm saying. Um, certainly the fear of disappointing anybody, particularly oneself, you know, that fear will come back to oneself. Like, I didn't fulfill my soul's purpose, so I'm a disappointment to myself, something like that. I think the ancestors, particularly those who are no longer in the body, they look upon what, our do, what we're doing and they have it in a very good perspective. And they realize that what we're doing as humans on the earth is just really hard. And, <laughs> you know, that we're, you know, we've been given these physiologies that are made just, just to barely be able to, <sighs> I missed him. You know I'm after you. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, these physiologies that are that have aspects built into them that support the diversification process, that support the the separation process. So, if our physiologies are con constructed in such a way that because they're physical material form that they help the perpetuation of the process of diversification and separation from wholeness, then in a way you could say, well, that puts us at a big disadvantage. <sighs> Fulfilling our heart's desires and achieving union, being able to navigate through the experience of being human and not losing our anchor to wholeness or, or managing to get through without getting overwhelmed from time to time or something like that. And of course, we all get overwhelmed from time to time. And that's the opportunity to navigate back and watch and uh, engage those mechanics that allow the piece that feels separate to regain wholeness and yet maintain its status as, you know, a unique form of creation. It's just a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. And we honestly wouldn't want to be without that opportunity because that opportunity gives life meaning and it's really amazing. But coming back to one's soul's purpose, just to put it in context, when you died in the last life, there was some deepest last flop of the wave of the being as it collapsed back into the source of creation. That last, last, last little piece of you that was left at the end of that process formed the seed for the next incarnation. And it formed the seed that I sometimes refer to as the heart's deepest desire. It's the desire that brought you into this lifetime to be here now. And the choice to be here at this time in history is a byproduct of the fact that your heart's deepest desire aligned up perfectly 
with the intentions of the source of creation for the evolution that it is doing at this point in creation. So the, the source of creation is going through all these amazing, phenomenal, incredible, great evolutionary changes. And there's this ocean of souls, each with their own heart's desire, their own little seed of what they would like to accomplish in the material world as a human being. And as a source of creation is moving through its paces, it's picking up all those souls whose hearts desire align perfectly with whatever the creation is doing at any particular time. Like for just for example, the level of diversity that we're dealing with, the information age that we're dealing with right now in creation is, uh, is an interesting thing to align with, right? And that's something that all of our souls, because we're all here right now, and of course, for our ancestors who weren't, okay, God bless you, and, and that your souls were aligning with the amount of information that was available in your lifetime and so forth. What that means is that your heart's desire is blessed by the divine, and it carries a momentum behind it that is the momentum created by universal evolution your personal evolution. You're here doing your personal evolution because what you're doing is supported by and upheld by and blessed by the universal intention to evolve at this time. So in a sense, it's virtually impossible. I guess I shouldn't say it's absolutely impossible. But I would say it would be, no, no, I looked at it. It's impossible. <laughs> it's impossible to not fulfill at least some portion of your heart's desire. It's inevitable that you would fulfill your heart's desire in this lifetime. At least some, as much of it as your physiology is capable of allowing you to fulfill. It's the point where your physiology gets overwhelmed then the evolutionary process starts to, it gets bound up and it gets um, constrained. Okay. So, and then you have to attend, make it better. And then you start moving forward again. So you have support of nature. You have the blessing of the whole universe behind the fulfillment of your soul's desire. And that means that it's like having a tidal wave behind you or something. It's going to push you along. Even if you resist, it's going to push you along. So you will achieve that in some way or another, at some point or another. Oh, I saw him. Okay, actually, it's probably her. Oh, big thank you. Shout out to you, Tom. Oh, and here, Aristotle, thank you to my dear husband. Aristotle lived between 384 and 322 BC. So 2000, about, you know, 14,000 years ago. No, 20, 22, 23,000 years ago, something like that. I missed him again. <laughs> okay. Thank you for those dates. I really do appreciate that. I did not know. All right. So here is another question. Hello, and this is such a valuable and important question. I hope I didn't knock my mic out here. Okay, looks like I'm still good. Um, Uh, curious about the ancestral healing karma and myotonic dystrophy that some friends of hers struggle with. Um, also curious about ancestral healing karma and the COVID vaccination. Well, that's interesting. So many people are dying in my community and many people have cancer, also many suicides. 
on K. So starting with the myoclonic dystrophy, it's a little bit like uh, muscular dystrophy. It's similar. It's that the it's a disease that does not have a cure at this time from modern medicine, where the muscles uh, deteriorate, basically. And it's interesting because the muscle cells in the body are the main the main place in the body where we make soma. And I doubt that there's I doubt that it's a coincidence because the soma is the value of the physiology that feeds or heals or nourishes the intelligence that heals the body. So we have intelligence in a form of consciousness that heals the body. And it is nourished or nurtured by soma, which is produced in the mitochondria and the cells in the body with the most mitochondria are muscle cells. And the most of the most are the heart cells. The heart's a big muscle. Lots of mitochondria in the heart, about 5,000 mitochondria approximately for every heart cell. And then there's some like, like hemoglobin cells don't have any mitochondria. Soma is the byproduct of awareness being anchored to the source of creation while you are digesting. It's produced, as you can imagine, in abundance at night, because at night, the awareness moves through the gap between waking, dreaming, and sleeping multiple times throughout the sleep cycles during the night. And in that gap, the awareness is transcending. The awareness is experiencing the source of creation. And when and we're digesting, there's a lot of digesting and processing and integrating and purifying that happens in the night's sleep. And a lot of soma is produced. And the soma produced at that time feeds the intelligence in the body that rejuvenates the body. That's why one of the reasons why we wake up in the morning feeling rejuvenated. It's related to the feeling of rejuvenation and freshness that we feel after a good night's sleep. Sorry, something's happening for the ancestors right now. There's also healing happening for the ancestors going into the moments when um, couples, for those couples who are married, which is the vast majority of them, this marriage moment is being blessed throughout the entire spectrum of the ancestral archive with the with a connection to the source of creation tangible concrete absolute presence of the silent source of creation in the point of the marriage ceremony where the vows are taken so that the individuals who are in the marriage ceremony and taking the vows, they're both taking the vows and they're watching themselves take the vows and they're giving the vows and they're watching themselves give the vows. And the watching part of their awareness is them anchoring into the source of creation. And as we were discussing earlier, the anchor goes through the channel of such sweet love. And I know, even as I'm looking at this, I know that there are some ancestors who had bad marriages. And there are people who felt abused by their partners and such. But the union is still being blessed. It's being blessed. And there's a big healing happening for those individuals who felt like they got abused in their lifetime. They're abused by their spouses because 
That's a choice that people make. Being in an abusive relationship is a choice that people make, their souls make. Remember, we, we come into the lifetime with the heart's deepest desire and the momentum of the source of creation behind us, it's, it's evolution. It's a fast path. It's not a comfortable path, but it's a fast path. to cultivating the ability to bring awareness into the source of creation and to anchor back to the source of creation and to recognize whatever it is that a person holds within themselves that acts like the magnet that attracts that, that little piece of darkness that attracts that negativity from the environment. That aspect of that spot where the imbalance is, that disallows the balance of truth, the truth that sits between not respecting and not appreciating oneself and narcissism. You know, in times past, when people made that, uh, that marriage vow, eh, they were kind of expected to stick with it, even, even if it meant their end, even if the relationship was horrible or something. I mean, but not so many of them were horrible. I mean, for the most part, our ancestors were survivors, you guys. For the most part, the people who managed to raise children to adulthood were the ones who were able to work together as a team. They were the ones who were able to stand side by side and face the challenges of raising children in a world where, you know, you froze in the winter if you didn't chop enough wood and, 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 <laughs> right? Or you starved if you didn't save enough food for the winter or so many things, so many, so many, so many, so many things. It was really the, the families that had a solid coordination between mother and father that were actually capable of raising children to adulthood. So most of the marriages were really sweet. Most of the mar marriages were dang good, actually. The others, they get more notoriety, right? They get more, they get more press. <laughs> but, and of course, nobody's perfect. And of course, the other side of that story is everybody's evolving. And often it's the relationship between the, the husband and wife that acts as the vehicle for each of their evolution, right? So they, like they have to face their lessons and face challenges and bounce off of each other to, you know, to figure out what it is that they're supposed to be, how they will fulfill their heart's desire in this lifetime, for example. But it wasn't always hard. And that value of bringing this, it's kind of like a, uh, there was this opportunity at this one moment when I was answering this other question for the, the source to like, to, to come through the source of creation to sort of like peek through into the fabric of the material world and to bless every single marriage. So I, I just jumped on that. Anyway, thank you for being with me on that account and how that process helps to mitigate the negativity that's experienced in the less desire you know, the relationships that are a little more dysfunctional and also to bless more completely the relationships that were really good bring them into a state of grace help provide some internal stability for both parties so that even at times of great challenge or loss there was all the values required and all the resources required to navigate through those experiences. Well done, everybody. You guys did that. Okay. So we looked at mitonic dystopy, uh, dystrophy and how that's in the muscles and it's in the mitochondria and, um, and how the, the mitochondria in the muscle tissue is not able to produce the soma to to rejuvenate and heal the muscle tissue itself. And this is this is this quality, um, the imbalance there 
is uh, an imbalance of, uh, I said it was excess and deficiency. It's, a, it's an imbalance of deficiency of giving, giving, giving to others, but not giving to oneself. And that's, that deficiency is sitting in the muscle tissue. Truth, truth of one's own nature and truth of how to redistribute resources and how to reprioritize one's time and energy in order to justify the truth helps you justify the reprioritization and the redistribution of energy so that one is nourishing oneself. And also understanding the mechanic that's a download for the ancestors as well. Anybody's ancestors who has anything even similar, slightly like this. And this particular imbalance can crop up in other ways as well. Like breast cancer, for example, is, you know, one of the kind of classic examples of a woman who gives and gives and gives and gives and gives, but she forgets to give to herself because the breasts are the nourishers, right? Anyway, um, however it manifests. The truth of one's nature and the acceptance that at any given moment within the context of the lifespan, we are working with ourselves as parts of ourself are completely like stabilized in their diverse nature and knowing that diverse nature is an expression of wholeness and other parts aren't at any point. And instead of thinking of the parts that aren't as imperfections, just realizing that those are the parts that we still have to work with and bring them over, bring them over to the other side where those parts of oneself recognize themselves as diverse and yet also wholeness expressing its diversity. And, and in, in a lot of cases, wholeness expressing itself as excess or wholeness expressing itself as deficiency. And that's okay. Because anywhere that wholeness is doing that, we, we as the point, as the, as the complete expression of who we are, our job is to find, is to seek out those little points and then support their reconnection and their rebalancing. And that's what we do. And as I mentioned before, that's what makes life meaningful. So it's not a bad thing. And that there's a lot of, there's a lot of excess baggage around that. There's a lot of, oh, I'm not good enough. And the fact that I, I even have to go through this process is proof that I'm like not perfect and all that, all that, all that. and offering it to the ancestors because a lot of those, a lot of that excess baggage was actually, a lot of that excess baggage was passed down through the generations and is part and parcel of the epigenome as it shows up when we're born, as we start out here. It starts out as part of the packaging there. So that's one of the things that almost universally we all have to overcome. It's really common. Oh, you showed up as you made a mistake and imperfect. Well, wow. I'm just feeling all that balancing. I think the overarching um, healing element, if we want to call it light medicine or aspect of the healing process is working with that point of balance because it it has to be present at every with every set of pairs in creation every set of opposites it's such a joy to have this extra time with all of you i love you look at i got extra time with you thank you so much i'll see you all tomorrow hopefully most of you and for those who i don't see live tomorrow you will get the recording and all the links and everything else that, you know, are going on here and all that. So, yeah, wow. <laughs> Thank you, you guys. I love you. See you soon. Bye-bye.